Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, The Future of Data-Driven Decision-Making, Integrating Machine Learning and Data Governance, sponsored by D3 Clarity and Precisely. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. If you would like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you'll see the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing links to the slides, a recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Dave Wilkinson and Rochelle Gibbs. Grubbs. Dave is the Chief Technology Officer at D3 Clarity. Over the past decade, Dave has been a thought leader in extracting knowledge from corporate data assets. Dave's approach focuses on desired outcomes. This focus directs the investment in tooling to maximize the outcomes value based on available data. By applying pragmatic thinking, his Six Sigma black belt skills, and agile execution techniques, Dave's approach enables valuable insights without massive effort and investment. Dave brings a wealth of skills to knowledge generation, including a data infrastructure, master data management, and data governance. Rochelle Grubbs is a senior director and solution architect for Precisely's data integration solutions. She has spent the last several years focusing on databases, analytics, data trends, and data integration. Rochelle is an expert on Precisely's OEM AWS mainframe migration offering and is driven to help customers successfully migrate their applications and workloads to the cloud. And with that, I will hand the floor over to Dave and Rochelle to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello and thank you. Um, thank you thank everybody you. for joining. This is Dave Wilkinson from D3 Clarity and I'm delighted to be joined by Rochelle uh, to talk about the future of data-driven decision-making and integrating machine learning and data. Please do, as Mark just mentioned, join us in the chat as well to engage with your fellow participants and also post any questions. We have some people in the chat, um, Alexis and Evan, certainly, who will engage with you. So please uh, join the conversation. So without anything further, let me start into the presentation, the future of data-driven decision-making and integrating machine learning with data governance. So if we look at modern technology, the recent innovations have revealed new and ex effective ways to not only transform your business, but continually to drive improvement, right? The modern technology, the interplay between data, the interplay between governance, data, machine learning is becoming increasingly crit crit critical as we transform businesses and uh, as an enabler for growth and enabler for business. Data governance provides accuracy, accessibility, and the security of the data while machine learning can significantly contribute to the evolution of those governance practices and of decision-making across the uh, in environment. Uh, there is a reciprocal relationship between governance and machine learning, and we're gonna talk more about that as we go through. We're gonna talk about the innovations in the market around machine learning, the transformation that it can do to business to improve and deliver value, deliver that value decision-making and deliver that value across the business as a whole. What are we going to talk about as we look at these, these discussion points? We're going to hypothesize that machine learning and data governance are actually a perfect union and go hand in glove as we evolve into the coming era of uh, machinery and the coming era of computing. We're going to do just a quick background defining machine learning and defining data governance and look at why they are essential, why they are necessary within the environment that we find ourselves and within the market that we find ourselves. And drill down in, in some level of that. We're going to look at the intersection of data governance and machine learning. And hopefully by that point, we'll have demonstrated that we believe machine learning and data governance are indeed a perfect union for businesses looking to take advantage of the future and transform themselves into the future. Of course, this doesn't come without challenges and considerations, and then we'll sum up pretty quickly and pretty cleanly with a little bit about D3 Clarity and Precisely. And we will take some questions at the end. So if you put your questions in the 
in the chat. We will absolutely hope to uh, deal with those as time permits as we get into the bottom of the hour, the back half of the hour. So again, thank you very much for joining us and please engage in the chat. Uh, Rochelle, do you want to take this away? Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Dave. So uh, one question that comes to mind is why Gen AI and machine learning in the first place? Well, you start thinking about all the data that's available, the, at, the reason becomes quite clear. On this slide, you can see some statistics. So uh, there are a huge amount of data that will be created by 2025. 180 zettabytes is the estimation. Uh, it, it's impossible to process all of that data without things like Gen AI and machine learning. Some additional stats, 94% uh, of uh, customers believe that it's critical for their five-year plan. And many companies are planning for uh, the ability to use that data by staffing up with data scientists, data warehousing, and the ability to be able to process that data. So the acceleration of decision-making and good business outcomes comes with more automation, higher scaling, and the ability to predict and create competitive advantage. So if we move to the next slide here, uh, and then of course, all of that data is gonna be uh, available or uh, customers are moving that data to the cloud. And uh, once you're there in the cloud, the chances are that you're already interfacing with some sort of AI or ML today, whether you realize it or not. Over 90% of leading businesses are using artificial intelligence. On the right-hand side of this slide, you can see some of the common applications. And I think you'd be hard pressed to say that you aren't interfacing with at least one of these kinds of applications. I was on a customer service uh, or a website yesterday uh, getting some uh, questions answered and I was surely talking to a chat bot. AI assistance, AI powered workflows, recommendations, all of those kinds of uh, applications are uh, powered by ML and, and AI. So then if we go to the next slide, the question becomes, is your data ready? Precisely partnered with Drexel University on a new research uh, capability to an, or a new research project to uncover the current state of data integrity, uh, data strategies, priorities, and challenges. This survey was done uh, early this year. And what we found is that only 12% of uh, the companies surveyed felt that their, their data was ready. So uh, if you don't have data that is accurate, consistent and contextual, then how can you trust that data to not create some of the challenges that are on the right-hand side of this screen? Things like bias, hallucination, inaccurate predictions, uh, data that's not relevant, all of those things are a danger when your data is not accurate, consistent, and trusted. And the challenge there then becomes, if you know that you fall in that category, you spend an inordinate amount of time on data prep instead of tuning your models to be able to uh, leverage the insights that they're sharing with, with you. So if now I'll turn it back over to Dave uh, to talk about some of the um, uh, things that we can do and how we can uh, provide uh, or apply data governance to help some of these challenges. Thank you, Rochelle, that's fabulous. There's some fascinating numbers in there, right? From 180 zettabytes of data being produced to 
I find the particularly interesting one is that 94% of organizations have AI and ML in their strategic roadmap over the next five years, and yet only 12% of them um, so believe that their data is ready. That, that to me, speaks volumes, and it, it should have us all a little bit uh, concerned, I think, going forward. So let's let's talk about that. So so the what we're hypothesizing, what we're saying here, is that machine learning and data governance are a perfect union. They are two disciplines that are very very different. They approach the world very differently. One's more process, one's more technology, but they are very different. And the machine, the data governance, is looking at the data set that you're collecting. The information that you're picking up about your business, the information that you have about your products, the whole the whole set of that, and it's looking for putting the processes, procedures, and policies in place that ensure that the data is of high quality, the data is consistent, secure, and accessible. What does that really mean, right? It really means that the data describes what it says it describes, that you can trust it, you can have confidence that the data does describe what it what it says it's going to describe, it is consistent in and of itself, and that nobody else is messing with it and accessing it. So that's where data governance is coming in. It's, it's really about that cadre of data and that basis of information that we're building around the business. And every business is building that history, that depth of knowledge on everything they do, whether it's a list of sales over the course of the year, whether it's the uh, products that are sold in different locations, whether it, customer support issues, et cetera, et cetera, across the whole uh, gambit of what they're, what they're operating on, building this history, this base, this, this great cadre of information. And then machine learning is looking at this from a different perspective. Machine learning is a set of technologies that allow us to delve into that data. And when we're talking about 180 zettabytes of data or just the amount of data that we're demanding and producing on a daily basis, it is impossible for an individual to really understand it and know it. So now machine learning comes in where we can build models, we can predict from patterns in the data, and we can allow those patterns to make or inform our decisions and then hopefully drive decision making and push this to we can ask machines, we can ask the technology to actually mimic us and present what we would do as decision makers, as executives, as people operating in the world, um, the decisions that we would make and predict those and move forwards. Right. So if we look at a little bit of definitions, as I said, data governance is the practices, processes and policies that ensure the management. Right. It involves just defining who can take what action upon what data, how is the data collected, what is the data quality that is necessary. Um, the primary goal is to ensure that data integrity and compliance with regulations. But it's not just the regulations. It's compliance with what you as a business want your data to describe. It's, it's compliance with the whole set of rules and also defining why was the data collected and what is it going to be used for? Uh, I had a conversation the other day with, with some people and we one of the conversations was, there is no bad data. There is just data that is evidence of bad behavior. It's good data, evidence of bad behavior. Well, is that the case? What does the data look like? Is this speaking now to why that only 12% of businesses believe that their data is ready to be used in a machine learning or an AI approach, right? Where you don't have that human intellect second guessing what the data is telling you and saying, am I really comfortable with that? Because machine learning doesn't necessarily give you that second level of critique that you get as an individual, right? We can look at sales figures, we can look at demographic figures, we can look at things as people and say, mm, do I really believe that? What is the context of this card of information? Is there something else there? And why we would like to think that we can teach the AI engines and so on, we can't necessarily, it is going to believe 100% the data that is put uh, in its model and in its cadre of decision-making. So machine learning 
an AI looks at the algorithms and improve automatically through experience and data usage. So it's only going to pay attention to the data that you give it, and it's going to mimic the decision set that we put on it to uh, deliver predictions based off of that. It does, however, represent a significant transformation in the way that we build applications and the way that applications and technology interact with the user base. And it's getting more and more prevalent where the systems, the variables, et cetera, are getting so vastly complex that we have to teach the machinery to learn from it versus understanding like traditional development where the decision trees are meticulously coded by developers and we have to understand the whole nuance of the SAT to say this input leads to this outcome. We don't necessarily know that anymore. And with the advent of machine learning and AI, we can teach the patterns to the machinery, show it the data, show it the outcomes that the data produced, and ask it to infer the algorithms and the processes that led to that. When we release that, it's great for uh, some uses. And as we move it into ever more in-depth decision making, we have to be way more confident of the data that we're feeding into the bottom. It's fine. Uh, the example that Rochelle used earlier was of a chat bot on a website with a probably a defined cadre of information. We use them every day, customer support type chat bots or interaction chat bots where you're working through a relatively complex decision set on a complex technical subject, but that it's constrained information. You know that information. Um, and this is an area where they are used and where we're getting great benefit. So why is machine learning important? It was designed to solve the problem of analyzing and making sense of large data sets and to mimic decision making, right? Eliminating the need for true sort of declarative definition of decisions and big uh, if then else type, type statements that lead to an outcome from a programming perspective, right? So working through an idea where how do we learn, how do we teach, how do we come up with outcomes from uh, a model, from our own observations? So it leads into the automation of these tasks, how do we, collecting of data sets. Let's connect, collect all the data sets that we can, that, that we believe are relevant, feed them through machine learning, feed them through some amount of models to develop the predictions and the decisions using complex statistics and mathematics. Right. So it's important because the data sets are getting bigger. That 880 zettabytes of data, the massive amounts of relevant information that is deemed relevant to us walking through our lives, we are demanding more and more as consumers, more data to be at our fingertips, more interaction, more depth of understanding, and some recommendations. We all like it when we get recommended a particular flavor or something or pair of shoes or whatever from a retailer and it's exactly what we want that makes life easier um what is that making those decisions on how is it making those decisions and making sure we can do that and that's the basis of those data sets that are being being fed into the algorithms and the predictions from an impact of machine learning here's a very classic example where machine learning was used in the sort of pretty much in some of the early days just as a trap for spam filters in email, where initially when we started using email or when spam became uh, popular, popular is probably the wrong word, the spam was never popular, but people seem to send it anyway. Um, the spam filters, you had to program them yourselves to eliminate either particular addresses or, or particular uh, words or whatever. With machine learning, we've managed to make spam filters that will actually read the email and they've become very sophisticated and autonomous. And sometimes they get it wrong. We have to go get some back, but it's we're not relying on that hard coded or hand coded rules. We're just letting the filters deal with it. And this is a, a fairly common use case. And we can see that expand into chatbot conversations, into various decision-making, into um, 
image type processing and that sort of thing, where this is becoming very, very sophisticated across the spectrum of technology and across the spectrum of our interaction. So why is data governance important? So often what we what we see, we see that data governance is focused at the information that is being collected, the information that is sitting uh, in a business, under a business, or across that business that describes everything that went on in that business. And, it, and there's a lot of aspects to data governance depending on the data that you need to govern or you want to govern. This ties very closely to business process, business structure, and making sure that the right data is at the right fingertips of the individuals, that the data does actually describe what it was supposed to describe. It describes the sale in completely, it describes the product completely. If your data is wrong, then um, it can lead you astray in terms of analytics, in terms of where the business is heading, leads, leading to poor decision-making, potentially regulatory breaches, et cetera, right? If you don't know exactly who your customer customers are or how your customers relate to each other, do you really know your total position with that customer, right? We did a, a project with, a, with an organization and it basically, after doing the data governance, we had to restate a lot of the financials because their top end customer list changed dramatically when we actually understood all the relationships across the customer base. And this is the kind of thing where if your data is not good, if you are making um, automated decisions based off data that was inaccurate or not completely describing the whole position, then that can lead to some problems and some um, issues, especially if you make those decisions sort of publicly with publicly facing without putting that uh, uh, human eyes on the on, on it and the humans cannot look at all the data there's just too much so data governance starts to address these issues by giving you the frameworks and the structures and the technologies to create the policies procedures and standards that start to ensure that your data is what you intended it to be that your data does actually describe what it says it's going to describe and that it can therefore be used in for the appropriate purposes, right? And you can look at it in that, in that way. And it provides that solution for integrity across your business where the confidence goes up across the entire business that the data does describe. It is consistent in all business units and therefore the, that decision-making becomes more accurate and you can operate with confidence that the decisions being made automatically mimic the decisions that you as an organization would have made versus uh, decisions that you don't think you should be making. The impact of data governance, we've seen this all the time. I just went through one example, um, which is inaccurate reporting and poor decision-making without proper data governance. The customer records are often duplicate or incomplete. Um, we see that the standardization of that data makes it much more up to date and much more frequent for all departments. As well as the security, we start to see that if we know exactly where the data is that describes a person, then some of the, re the requirements for privacy become much easier. The need to be forgotten, the ability to say to comply with GDPR or other regulations that require security, require privacy. Uh, HIPAA and other areas, we're not making mistakes by accident, which we shouldn't be doing. We also get more uh, informed strategic decision making, launching new products and into new markets, etc. With improved data, and we've seen true benefits as we've dropped uh, as we've put in data governance technologies and data governance processes, where we've seen lifts in revenue, better customer satisfaction and a number of other real strong hard benefits from governing the data uh, with the business and starting to really change the behaviors, not only of the data, but also the people operating with that data within the business and within, within the environment. So we see 
huge amount of benefit from just data governance. So as we bring them together and we start to say, okay, how do these two marry together? How do they how do they really work together? And why why do we uh, really look at them as two symbiotic sort of technologies and approaches? The foundational principle of machine learning is that it's going to learn from the data. It's going to observe the data set and look at the outcomes over the course of history and look at potential models of outcomes from that data so that we can interpret and predict and make automated decisions based off of that data and therefore lead to significant benefits across the business, both ones that we would see manually and hopefully some that we don't see manually, right? Just because the data is too big or there's hidden patterns in the data. So the, the goal is that machine learning picks up the data it learns from the data and develops those outcomes on its own and, and then states those benefits. But there's, there's a flaw in that, right? If you don't trust that data, if the data set is not what you think it should be or is not what it says it is, then there's no choice, but the outcomes are gonna lead to benefits, it's a difficult word to use in that in, in instance, right? That you don't, that you can't predict or benefits that you don't want. Well, it's not really a benefit, is it? Right? So if you, if you get the data set wrong that you're feeding into the learning cycles, then your outcomes are going to be different than what you want. And that's going to lead you in some places and lead you down some roads that you might not want to go. And we naturally as individuals second guess everything we look at and decide whether is this decision correct within my frame of interaction, et cetera. And machine learning doesn't necessarily give you that second guessing. What data governance therefore gives you is the processes, policies, and standards, and the metrics to govern and understand and manage that data to ensure that the data maps onto what you want it to map onto, that it does actually describe what it says it's going to describe, and it describes it at a level of quality that is useful and can be used and has metrics in it that allow you to see how the data is behaving so that as you feed it out to a data set that you feed then to machine learning, you can be confident that the outcome is going to be what you'd want it to be and you're accelerating it and you can operate within the integrity of your business and within the values of your business, right? If you because you can you can predict the nature of the decision, if not the decision itself. So the way we look at it is machine learning relies on data governance to ensure the quality of the data, to ensure that the business objectives are set by the people and that the data, the quality underneath the whole structure is where it needs to be. So we look at it as a to a certain extent, this three-legged stool with machine learning deliver the, delivering the predictions, delivering the benefits, but it's standing on top of the algorithms that were derived from looking at the data, the data itself, and also the data governance within that to ensure that the data is where you want it to be and that it matches where you want your business to go, right? There's a, there's, we've always got this North Star of behavior which is directional and leading us into the future behavior of the organization, growth, et cetera. And we're, how, do, how do we ensure we're getting there? Well, if the data, if we put data governance around that to ensure that the data describes the history that leads us to the future that we want, then machine learning and AI will bring us there and accelerate our journey there uh, without taking us astray with um, flawed data and flawed decisions. Now, that's not to say that the data that we govern can't be used and that the, these technologies aren't useful within the cycle of managing data. We've got a number of instances just within D3 Clarity where we've worked with our clients to use machine learning and AI models to analyze data streams and to automatically correct 
where there's common patterns of errors in the data, we can absolutely use these technologies to learn from the data streams and to auto-correct the data streams to make sure that the data quality is what it needs to be. We the same with data consistency, making sure and putting checks and balances in your business process and in your data flow processes to ensure that the that the data as it flows from one one system, one organization to another is consistent as it flows into another one. So there's there's areas, definitely areas where these technologies, these machine learning and AI technologies have a significant impact on the data governance practices that we put in place, whether it's data quality, data security, data consistency, or the accessibility of, of data, right? We can use machine learning to uh, predict and analyze access patterns to preserve security and various other things across the organization. So there's this symbiotic viewpoint where these technologies work really well within the data landscape to make sure the data is good. But then once the data is good, of course, you're feeding it back to these higher level models to ensure that the um, predictions and the models and the decisions is good from the machine learning area, right? So there's this, there's this symbiotic relationship, which is we absolutely use the technologies within the data flows, and then we absolutely use the data flows to predict and feed machine learning and AI technologies for chatbots, decisions, et cetera, uh, and make those accurate predictions. And we've seen this across the board, whether it's retiring, you know, taking data out of service from a data quality point of view that is no lot that has been uh, made obsolete so that the customer support chatbots are now operating on the correct up-to-date data set. Uh, we've seen uh, deletion and cleanup of customer records and contact records and product records, et cetera, with uh, learning from um, AI type engines to clean that up and then feed that data out to the broader use of AI. Happens all the time. So if I pull this together, we end up with a going back to the previous diagram, but slightly modified one, right? We've got machine learning and data governance. They are, they come together to form this perfect union, if you like. And and you know, we see this time and time again that people often start with a intent to invest in machine learning. And going back to the statistics that were made earlier. 94% of organizations have a strategic intent to invest in machine learning and AI, of which 12% think the data is actually good enough. I would hypothesize that it is actually lower than that 12%, and the 12% are probably deluding themselves a little bit, or they don't understand the data as much as they think they do, which we see quite frequently as well. So... When we look at this diagram, we've got the original data sources where we collect all our data, which needs to feed into a data governance program, which is layered across your data integration program, MDM programs, various other programs, but your data governance program, which is looking at the data quality, consistency, security, and accessibility. Each one of those might have a component of machine learning in them where you're learning from that data flow to pull that together. But you're also defining the policies, the procedures, the checks and balances, the structures that start to say, this data is good enough for this purpose, is it good enough for that purpose? And then you're starting to develop, well, if I ask the data this question, can it answer that? And you feed that into that machine learning engine where you're starting to uh, do the data science to predict those answers and pull out the models that are based off of governed data the predictions that are based off of that governed data and those reliable decisions now that you're making based off of that governed data. So you can you can make, you can predict those decisions, you can make those decisions, and then you start to see the accelerated business outcomes, which is what you're looking for, right? Because you're now able to automate these decisions and feed them through. So we've got the machine learning embedded within all things data governance to make sure we're watching everything appropriately and then we've also got data governance embedded in those um, machine learning and ai 
models to produce the outcomes that we expect and the outcomes that we want. Okay. Of course, there are some challenges and considerations, and this has come of what we're trying to, to um, protect against. If we ask those 12 people, those 12% of the individuals that don't, that actually not the 12%, if we ask the 88% that believe their data isn't ready for AI and machine learning, what does this mean? What do they mean by that? Why don't they trust the decisions that are being is it that their data doesn't describe what can they make decisions on it they are making decisions on it their business is operating they're usually operating very successfully businesses but they're doing it on human feel human thought human uh, interpretation the data can often contain bias and inaccuracy we are all slightly biased for different things you know the color blue particular shade of color blue right um we we have a lot of bias in what we want we choose things of that color or that nature or whatever um do we want that to be reflected in the way that we are operating if our data because we've always sold a particular color of of jacket or something do we want that to be reflected in our prediction of the future or do we want to distill that out so we need to look at our data and our models with that in mind to correct for where we want to go as a future and make sure our data and our models are taking us in the direction we want to go rather than just tied to the data that describes our path and this can lead to skewed and inaccurate models which can start to impact the processes. There are complexities in the implementation, right? You know, machine learning is not without its level of complexity and requires the skilled personnel and technical resources. We also need the depth of understanding and bring to that. The data governance is often less technical focused and more around how do we want our business to operate? The business acumen becomes extremely necessary and the depth of knowledge in our business. So bringing those two together is absolutely necessary. But are they speaking the same language? Do the people have the same outcomes and speaking the same language to put in the machine learning and the AI type principles of deeply technical work with the business acumen and the structure that we want in our business going forward so that we can um, make sure we're learning and predicting properly. And then the privacy concerns, making sure that any algorithm, any audience that is receiving the output of any one of these algorithms is getting just the decision that is made with the data that is appropriate for that audience. We've got to be super concerned with that and make sure that this model this usage, this chatbot is constrained to just the card of information that it should use for its purpose, right? The technology doesn't necessarily care about that. It will look at whatever it's allowed to look at to do that. So we have to know what is, what is in our data so that we can guarantee the integrity, the confidentiality, and the structure of that data to make sure it is appropriate for our audience. We can't just release everything on top of a sort of massive cadre of data and uh, pull that together for anybody. Uh, Rochelle, do you want to add to that? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Uh, as you've been talking, I've been thinking about uh, you know, all the things that you have to uh, consider, some of the challenges, but without AI and ML, your data is exposed to a, a wealth of potential harmful effects or impacts. Uh, when you think about some of those impacts, uh, it could be examples of bias where uh, maybe a tutoring company that automatically rejects a certain type of person, age or gender, uh, 
because or automatically and uh uh you because it doesn't know any better because it has bad information uh things like um making uh biased decisions on age or sex or race all of those things can be uh very harmful impacts uh to your company and without data that's high quality that is well governed businesses are also exposed to things like hallucinations uh, that deliver incorrect analysis or recommendations. So without high profile or with some of those high profile stories, uh, we can uh, we hear about in the media, uh, you know, can be a little bit uh, scary or uh, uh, even surprising. And of course, at the top of many enterprise legal teams lists is uh, without proper guidance, security and privacy uh, sensitive data is of course at risk. So we wanna make sure that uh, uh, when data is accurate, but it doesn't have context related to the real world, such as things like consumer insights and uh, property attributes, that can also result in irrelevant information. So when we think about the three categories here, we want to make sure that you uh, are uh, eliminating bias, inaccuracy, and irrelevance by feeding your AI models accurate data, relevant data, as well as current data so that it can make good decisions. Excellent. And Thank Dave, you, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Rochelle. That's excellent. We're uh, coming to the end and we'll start questions in, in, in just a few minutes. Just a little bit about D3 Clarity. Why should you listen to us? Um, we've been around for an, a large number of years as in the industry, uh, from data consulting across the board with large and small organizations. We do a lot of projects in data across many different industries frequently, recognized by Gartner. Um, and then we we like to get deep into our clients. We like to really understand what our clients are doing uh, and look at the data architecture, the enterprise data strategy, and various aspects of that up to and including that business value and driving that with uh, models, machine learning, AI, and decision making. Rochelle, do you want to say a little bit about Precisely? Sure. I can share... Uh... A uh, little bit about Precisely, uh, we are a leader in data integrity. Uh, we have approximately 12,000 customers all around the world in 100 countries. Uh, of those customers, 99 of the Fortune 100s are our customers, and we have about 2,500 employees all across the world. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, some brands that uh, I, I'm guessing uh, people on this webinar most likely know one or two of those brands, uh, as well as uh, data leaders that partner with us on the bottom part of the screen. And then uh, if we want to talk a little bit about how you can prepare for the journey, uh, and uh, make your data accurate, consistent, and trusted. Uh, the uh, Precisely portfolio includes the Precisely Data Integrity Suite. So that is a, a solution that many customers use to uh, offer a, a flexible SaaS interface to be able to make your data accurate, consistent, and, and contextual and ultimately trust it. It has a business friendly interface and allows you to provide uh, capabilities to your data or um, uh, consistency to your data, no matter where you are on the journey of doing so for your enterprise. On the bottom, you can see the different services that make up the suite. And even though they're depicted linearly, you in no way have to execute them linearly. If all you need is geo addressing, 
then you can start there. If all you need is data observability, you can start there. Uh, you can mix and match and uh, choose the services that make the most sense for your environment. Thank you, Rochelle. That's fabulous. And just thank you, everybody, for listening. I want to remind everybody that we've got about 15 minutes left for questions. If you want to hear more from, from me, from us, from D3 Clarity, then please tune into our podcast, Talk Tech with Data Dave, where we answer any number of questions across the techn technology industry, data and uh, machine learning AI and, and other things. I want to thank Dataversity for hosting us today and for precisely for being an excellent partner as we go through this, where we uh, implement their products in a number of our clients and work with them, and work their technologies for the betterment of their clients. So thank you very much. That's the uh, prepared material. And uh, Mark, do we want to open up for questions? Sure. Um, and chat's been electric all presentation. I don't know if you've uh, been following along or been able to follow along, but there's a lot of fascinating discussions there. And we've got a couple of great questions in Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll dive into some of those. How do you prove or disprove bias or accuracy? <laughs> Um, that's a really difficult question and there is no, I, I, I'm not sure there is a proof for that, to be honest with you, both, um, from a technical perspective and from a philosophical pers perspective, the only real way to do it is to look at, is the decisions and the predictives predictions heading in the direction that you want them to be. You have to ultimately especially thinking about bias, then you have to think about what do you want? What 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 do you want to put forth in the world? What is the model that you want to portray in the world, right? As an individual, as an organization, as a set of decisions, you are the decisions and you are what you speak, right? You are the perception that you give people. So if you can't, you have to start with what, am I trying to put out there? And then you have to measure deviation from that. And you can do that statistically, you can do that in various different ways, um, but there is no science necessarily to that other than looking at it from a purist perspective and starting to say, if I predict all these decisions, if I predict the structure, what am I gonna get? Is that the... Um, outcome that I'm trying to produce, right? If I'm consistently predict pred predicting green instead of blue, then I need to do a correction. But I have to know that I'm trying to actually put out forth blue before I can measure the deviation from that. Does that answer the question? I believe it does, yeah. And you're right, it is a, a very challenging question uh, to, to answer. Um, We've got a couple of questions, uh, both in chat and in Q and A, about the semantic layer. Do you? Th what are your thoughts on the semantic layer being uh, useful for data literacy, but also for feeding into uh, ML? So, <clears throat> I, th I I actually think the semantic layer, or the semantic layer, or the way I'd like to look at it, is actually looking at it from a logical or conceptual data architecture across across the organization right so if you mm -hmm. if you build a semantic layer you build a data model where you understand the way your data interacts across the organization then you do get a huge amount of context what that gives you is it makes sure you know where the data resides that needs to reside and and what you should be doing is looking at all the definitions that exist in the entities across your semantic layer and the interactions and linkages across that. As you as you do that, you kind of need, my belief is if you're going to use machine learning and AI and predictive type analytics in your organization effectively, you have to know how your organization behaves and you have to build and understand what is that uh, enterprise data architecture essentially and that becomes the high level model for your semantic layer that is sitting un underneath that of course your semantic layers can you can have more than one semantic layer 
to describe particular aspects of the business or particular aspects of that. And that is perfectly reasonable as well. It's really about understanding the way the data interacts. So understanding um, how that data comes together and therefore feeding into a predictive model that actually makes sense and understands that. If you don't build the semantic layer as you're working through it, then you could easily miss a certain amount of data, miss an interaction that is important, and therefore introduce bias and introduce other issues with a lack of complete data set. So I think it's very important just to understand the way your business operates from both a machine learning benefit perspective and also from a data governance perspective to understand how the data interacts with other data. Wonderful. Um, I mean, this one of my favorite questions of all time is is always about collaboration. Our data scientists have tended to ignore data governance as not my job. How do we get them working with data governance and helping out as they surely can with data <laughs> governance? <laughs> That's actually a brilliant question. I love that question. It is. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so the most data, data scientists that I've talked to, they do say that's not my job. But also, if you drill into what they do on a daily basis, they spend an inordinate amount of time preparing their data and making their data look like what they want it to make, look like so that they can get their model, right? I actually think it is imperative that we link the data scientists with that business acumen that I was talking about, right? So making sure that you've got the individuals that know the data, but don't just know the data at a syntactic level, they know the semantic level of the data. That's where the semantic layer comes in really importantly, right? Understand the business and understand the way the data describes the business because your data scientists will lead themselves astray with ignoring data that isn't populated enough but we as business people might know that that data can't be ignored because although it's sparsely populated it is critically important to prevent bias or prevent other unwanted outcomes so i think it's critically important to tie those together and we should be looking at the technologists the technologists are not in an island here we are now getting to the point where technology is materially impacting business outcomes and business decisions and therefore if we model it incorrectly if we build it incorrectly we will get it wrong and we can't afford to get it wrong so we need those data scientists to be tightly coupled with the business acumen the business semantics and with that that needs to cascade all the way down into those policies those procedures those standards etc that we drive through governance to ensure that the data that gets up to the data scientists and into the models is the most appropriate data for the outcomes that we're looking for. Excellent. Um, we have another fascinating question here too. Um, and I think this came from a little bit of the, the chat conversation that was going on. Uh, many don't believe their data is ready because of one or more data quality dimensions that have not been met, validity, completeness, consistency, integrity, timeliness, et cetera. Where does data bias fall? Is it another data quality dimension? I don't know whether data bias is a quality dimension. That's a, that's a really good question. The, the, the dimensions of data quality that we're talking about are pretty easy to measure, right? Um, and I would, I would postulate that bias is a little harder to measure, as we talked about earlier. And it doesn't talk about the data bias so much as it talks about the historical bias, right? And let me talk about that. If you, if you think about it, we can take a element of data, an event, and we can say, is this element accurate? Does it accurately describe the event that took place? Is this data complete? Well, has it got all the components in it that describe the event, right? We can look at that and we can look at data quality from that level of almost syntactic construct. If we take bias, for example, while bias might be evident in that, I think the, 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 the bigger question for bias is if I've got a stream of these events, do they demonstrate a bias towards 
of behavior in one direction or another that I either want to replicate or not replicate or, co or, or consciously divert from um, just because of a fact of history, right? And so I think that's much harder. And I don't think it is necessarily a dimension of data quality in the way that we normally talk about data quality. I think it's a fascinating thought to as to how do you measure, how can you see historical bias and therefore alter your predictions to eliminate or correct for it? Can yeah, it's... It, well, it's a really interesting thought and and just thinking about like consistency and accuracy as factors in determining bias, but even then, how do you measure it explicitly? It's almost like it needs uh, an ethicist to be involved, right? Yeah, <laughs> it you, becomes you a really have, interesting question. Right. You've almost got to run a set of predictions and then assess a regression against them to extrapolate where the predictions are going and then decide whether those predictions or that history is following the curve that you want it to follow, to put it in a exactly. mathematical term, right? And then correct within that and do further experimentation. But I'm not sure the, the data quality dimensions are quite, are quite there. You, could, you can make other predictions. You can say, oh, we've got to tend a trend towards good or bad completeness or whatever but i'm not sure we can quite say that about bias because bias is so subjective yeah excellent point yeah it is subjective uh i think we have time for one last question here uh can you speak on the cost or savings when data governance programming could substantiate uh the quality of the underlying data which can eliminate the need to clean the data prior to machine learning consumption so to correct it up front is always not always but it's significantly cheaper if you can cor correct the behavior that creates bad data then it is often cheaper than correcting the data after the fact because essentially you're doing increased work to correct data that could have been entered correctly i've used the word correct an awful lot in that sentence and that doesn't really work. <laughs> But the the idea there is we, um, for example, we uh, was working with a client a little while ago, and they built into their predictive their forecast um, essentially export fines and for violations against export policy because they didn't know their customer well enough. As we put in more and more data governance and more and more controls, not only on the data. Um, here we're using data as a proxy for business process, essentially, and measuring the business process through the data. So as we started to change and tighten up the business process and therefore the data, it became cost avoidance on the cost of doing things wrong, whether it was, like I said, uh, inappropriate shipment in, in from exports or you know inappropriate shipments because units of measure were wrong. So we had another client that shipped spools of wire instead of feet of wire right so mm -hmm. there's a cost avoidance factor where as your data quality goes up as your data governance goes up as you push back into the business you're essentially starting to change behavior and change um the way data is create created and consequently the cost avoidance of remedial action goes down right well, on, on that note, uh, I have to agree with with chat. This was a great discussion. We've got a lot of thank yous and, and good discussion notes in chat. So uh, uh, thank you very much, Dave and, and Rochelle, for this wonderful presentation and uh, the teams at both D3 Clarity and Precisely uh, for, for getting together and, and talking about AI and data quality and data governance and, 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 and this wonderful presentation. So thanks again. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you everybody Thanks for attending. For